Hey there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it might be where you are out there. Welcome back to the live stream. My name is Jeff Fritz, and today, today is another learning C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. It's so good to see you out there. Let me say hello. There's a bunch of folks here in the chat room. Let me bring that up. There it is right over there. <clears throat> I'm going to scroll up a little bit there. Nitro Evil asks, are we early today? Uh, it might feel that way. We haven't hit the American Daylight Savings Time. I know in Europe and other parts of the world they've we they've already gone through the change from summertime to regular time that in the states we call it daylight savings that adjustment hasn't happened here yet i think we're due this weekend or next weekend not sure hey there x neldron discordia hello good to see you sly wolf good morning asking a question about covering cicd i have another video that covers that we're not going to get quite into CICD today. It's a little bit further along. Um, and Nikhil, how, how you doing? Good morning in India. D D Diraj, good evening to you. Sir Dudes a lot. Almost missed the start of the stream. Uh, are you moved out of... Nope, nope, nope. Uh, there's that daylight savings challenge that we're running into. How's it going there? Rolly Rolls. Method Man, Redman fan. How you doing there? Anton, how's it going? Tinker Foo. Buongiorno to everyone from Switzerland. Hello, hello. Johnny B. Cat, Shakti Singh, good morning to both of you. Uh, Jaya Kumar, good morning from India. In the evening, your time, right? Uh, you've been looking forward to talking about, uh, talking, the, okay, that's cool. Started daylight savings in New Zealand a month ago, says life-size teddy bear. All right, yeah, that makes sense. Sarik from Sydney, Australia. Uh, Vu, how's it going there? So, the idea today... We've gone through, we've been using .NET notebooks to build and work with C Sharp for the past, eh, for the past two months. And we've, we've learned a lot about the programming language, but we haven't actually learned how to build, we haven't learned how to build a program, how to write an actual thing that we can use, that we can hand off to someone else and, and share and, and, and show the amazing progress that we've made. So today we're going to learn about the project system in .NET. We're going to learn what a C-sharp project is, how to get started with projects, what a solution is. And, and solutions are kind of unique to .NET, uh, unique to working with Visual Studio is really where those came from. And we'll learn how to create some references between, between various projects, how they, they can be managed inside of our solution. And then we're going to get into some unit testing later today. We're going to learn how to write code that tests our code. So that's the agenda today. How's it going? Let me say hello to some more folks here. Alexander in Ukraine. Uh, Mon from Japan. Farhad from Ukraine. How's it going there? Roberto says, in Italy, they started daylight savings yesterday. There you go. How's it going? Jason Bach. He's one of our friends from Rocket DevRel, the Rocket DevRel channel over there on Twitch. Make sure you check them out. They're doing some really cool discussions over there. First Sunday of November. Yeah, so we'll see it this coming weekend. That's going to be weird. That's going to be weird because next week, 
right? Let's let's do a little calendar update here. Next week, I will not be streaming at this time. Um, we have we have our Visual Studio 2022 launch event. That's one week from today on November 8th. So if you're watching this live, make sure you get all ready, get tuned in for that. It'll be on all the Visual Studio channels. Um, and you'll be able to find more on visualstudio.com about the release and the release event, all the sessions that we're going to have live for you online for Visual Studio 2022. Now, it's going to be weird for me because Sunday next week, on Sunday the 7th, oh my gosh, I finally get to fly back to Seattle. I'm going to be flying to Seattle, and uh, so I'm going to have to go through not just daylight savings time change, but then change to to Seattle time. All right. So, um, because on the 9th, Tuesday the 9th, Monday the 8th, Visual Studio 2022, Tuesday the 9th, .NET 6 launch, .NET conf, three straight days of content for you coming live from Microsoft Studios. Every bit of it is live. There is nothing recorded as part of .NET conf. You get to see all the bells, all the whistles, all the all the flubs that we might have. There is no editing. There is no man behind the curtain working on demos and making sure they're perfect. No, it is all live. Next week, starting on Tuesday, I'll be live from the studios, um, we, with my, uh, I can I can share now with my co-host Kendra Havens on day two of the event. We'll be bringing .NET Conf to you. Um, we've got two, um, we've got we've got two uh, viewer uh, what viewer viewer uh, code parties right attendee events that you can you can win prizes answering trivia questions checking out stuff from our sponsors. We've got two of them. I'm going to be co-hosting those with Richard Campbell from .NET Rocks. I hope you tune in for those. We've got one at the end of day one for those folks that are in Pacific time zone, Asian time zone. And so that's about five in the evening Pacific time, um, 8 p.m. Eastern. If I keep going around the clock there, that's going to be what? 1 a.m. in Europe, UTC. But it'll be first thing in the morning for those of you in India and uh, Asia, Australia. The next one that we have is first thing in the morning for us on uh, day two. We're going to be starting at 7 a.m. Pacific time. So, new, uh, I'm sorry, 10 a.m. Eastern. And what is that? Add the five. And 3 p.m. UTC. You'll be able to tune in and participate and win some cool prizes and have a good time in our viewer attendee event. We're really looking forward to that. And of course, day two into day three, 32 hours straight, not 24 hours straight. 24 hours is nothing. Anybody can do 24 hours. We're doing 32 hours straight from 9 a.m. Pacific all the way through to 5 p.m. on Thursday. We've got presenters from all over the world. Six of the seven continents are covered. Uh, sorry, Antarctica. Um, we couldn't find any penguins to present this time, I guess. I, I don't know. But we've got folks from every continent presenting. There's, you're going to see folks from your part of the world, from your time zones, teaching about all kinds of things.net. The entire event is being recorded, will be available on YouTube. Uh, shortly after, probably within the next week, you'll start to see sessions popping up out on YouTube. We're really looking forward to it. Check it out, .netconf.net. That sounds weird dot net conf dot net is where you'll find all the information about that virtual conference it's our biggest dot net event of the year i hope you tune in next week let me say hello to some more of the folks up here in the chat room um uh, vasily how's it going in moscow fuzzy's here from kuwait sir dudes a lot yes visual studio launch day nikki's here from bulgaria oh my gosh bulgaria is the furthest east in europe that i've been I haven't, I was in Czech Republic. I, I don't, I don't get out of North America a lot. Um, never been to Asia, never been to Australia. Uh, certainly never been to, to India, South America, Africa. I uh, need to work on this. Need to work on my travel a little bit. How you doing there, Osama in Jordan? Hey, Nick. Uh, Nick Chapsis. There you go. There's a great YouTube streamer. So good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Feels natural. Yes. Live streaming does feel natural. Let me tell you. 
Um, it is certainly a, uh, a a different model of presenting. Um, I've I've I have thousands of hours of pre-recorded material out and available on YouTube, Wintelect Now, Plural Site, um, and I don't get anywhere near the viewership that I do on my live content. Um, let me see here. Hello to you, Carlos in the Dominican Republic. Uh, do, 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 do. Have I been to Serbia? No, I have not. Method Man, Red, Red Men fan. Nope. Um, Sharaf, hello to you. Good evening in Egypt. Terry's here from the Carolinas. Nikhil from India. Jorman from Montreal. Jorman? Is that how you pronounce that? Carlos from the Dominican. So good to see you. Dinesh from India. How's it going there? Bilgehen from Turkey. I love seeing the little flags popping up there too. That's cool. Um, so I have, I have everything all set up I, and today's the start of November, right? We're, we're done with Ubuntu. -ober. We spent the last month in October. We did all of our .NET programming using a Linux based machine right on the metal Ubuntu Linux. Um, so a little something I, I like to call Ubuntu. -ober. I don't know. That's not catching on. We need to do something to try and get that catching on. Can you, can you do something over there about that? Um, but November, I'm back on Windows, and we're teaching about C Sharp here. It, many folks out there in the JavaScript world, they're so celebrating Node-vember. So over on my channel, we're going to be doing Node-vember as well on my Twitch channel. All month long, nothing but JavaScript. I'm, I'm, my JavaScript is like this. I'm great with C Sharp. I, I took it as my name, C Sharp Fritz, right? But I'll be over doing JavaScript over on my channel um, on Twitch for a good part of the month. Hello to you, Massage. Uh, massage? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. In Poland. Emmanuel in Germany. MS from England. Hello, hello. Live content's a great method of delivery. I. Here's the thing I could produce recorded material, and, and I've produced a lot of it. Fact of the matter is, um, quite frankly, I, 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 the comments that I get from folks on my pre-recorded material are overwhelmingly negative. That's just the way it is. Um, I, I would much rather prefer to have the engagement to be able to talk directly to you and answer your questions and interact with you live on, on a feed like this. And that's just me. So, how you doing, Namaste Geek? Uh, hello to you in Tunisia. Is that La Gili? Stuart the Coder, looking forward to trying the new Visual Studio, especially with .NET 6. Yeah, it's I'm I've really been enjoying it. How you doing, TG? Gohaku from New York City. Anton, sometimes we need something in between. Not so heavy like full-fledged solution, not so simple like .NET notebooks. Will I cover CSX? No. Mm -mm. I'm this channel is is a Microsoft uh, it, it Microsoft owned channel. Um, CSX is not a technology that that we support, so I will not be covering it on these channels. Uh, first time here, where can you find previous sessions, Amir? Check out the playlist C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. You're on YouTube. It's on in the YouTube channel. Click into playlist, and it's about a half dozen down there. Uh, C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. So you can also find, I have a Blazor series in there as well. Um, some pretty good stuff. Hey, Wild Genie. Um, is that R. Lapoli? So, Namaste Geek took a bit of C-sharp in college, but really just part of one class. Didn't get a ton out of it. That's okay. That's okay. Any plans to visit, visit Russia? No, sorry. Um, I, until I get the go-ahead that, that I have budget to leave the States, it's not happening probably until at least mid-2022, at least. How you doing there, Young, in Vietnam? I hope I got that right. Messai. Okay, cool. I will remember that. All right. Let's get into this. Let me get some music playing here in the background. Um, this is the Stream Beats playlist. Um, yeah, let's do Synthwave today. Uh, yeah, that's fine to start with. This is... Stream Beats by Harris Heller. This is music that's been written, designed to be DMCA free, royalty free. You can listen to it wherever you might be broadcasting. YouTube, 
Twitch, Facebook, doesn't matter. You can have it on in the background. Check it out at streambeats.com. There's playlists there for Apple Music, uh, Amazon Music, Spotify, and you can listen to this music and you can even download it and have it on in the background. Maybe you like some of this groovy music. There's all kinds of genres there. Rock, uh, uh, rap. Of course, I like the EDM and synthwave playlists because they're just kind of groovy tech sounding that we can have on in the background there. So um, all the descriptions of what we're going to be covering just below me here in the description section. You can click through, of course, to our GitHub repository, github.com slash C sharp Fritz. Let me grab the URL and just post it. Just post it right here for you because uh, you're going to want it. And actually today I, I don't really have significant samples that we're going to be clicking through. Really, we're going to be we're, we're going to be talking through some things and looking at uh, a bit of documentation to get things started today. How you doing there, Bulldog? Bulldog Paw, is that a schematic diagram of a synthesizer behind me? No. This is actually inspired. It, it's it inspired by the circuit board inside of a stream deck. The the Elgato stream deck piece of hardware. Um, you may have seen this. It's a little. It's a little external keyboard. It's got five keys that light up with whatever I want to put on it. Um, I have four of them here. It's a bit much. But I've got four of them because I've got all the sound effects, all the camera control here. And uh, we grabbed, the, my artist friend grabbed the the schematic, a picture of one of those, and turned it into uh, all this behind me. And, of course, my little robot mascot behind me. Um, can I talk about web config? Sorry, that's off topic, TG. Drop me a line on, drop me a line on Twitter. Drop me a line on on my Discord, happy to go further into that. That is, sorry, that's off topic for today. Um, but web config is is certainly something that I have significant experience with as a web developer. We are broadcasting out to, of course, YouTube, Twitch, and we are on Pubble. We are on uh, live. We're live on Learn TV. Uh, I don't see anybody chatting over there right now. That's okay. We are going to move in and get started with our next topic. Double checking all the things here. Let's change mics and get ready to go over to the other set so we can dig into what we're talking about today. There, right? microphone change because I'm going to go for I'm going to go for a little walk. Head over to the other set where I've got the teleprompter chat in front of me and all the good things so that we can get into Visual Studio 2022. You know what? I think we'll we'll talk about .NET six projects today. Yeah, and uh, show you projects, solutions, a little bit at the command line, and of course, we're going to get into unit tests today as well. All right, let's do this. Let me head over to the other scene. It is right over here. All right, I got the coffee. I got the phone, so I've got my timer in front of me. Heading over here, and hey. Hello, there we go. Um, I tried to get this cleaned up last time. Let me see if I can just push that filter just a smidge on the camera there. One second, one second. I thought I had that cleaned up before I got over here. Uh, da -da -da -da. I think that's it. That'll do. That'll do. There we go. Nah, I'm still going to see a little bit of the reflection. It's because the uh, the camera iris changes when I'm over here. Because I'm reflecting light. Look at me, reflecting light. All right. <clears throat> How's it going? Let me keep an eye on the chat room. I have you loaded up right here in my teleprompter so I can see everything that's going on. How you doing there? No JS. One, two, three, four... Three, two, one. How's it going? You want the hat command right now? Sorry. That, in those of you that might be interested, that is Clippy. Um, I put a hat and a rainbow beard on him. If you're on my Twitch channel, um, that's one of the emotes 
that's available over there on Twitch TV, C Sharp Fritz. It's also one of the stickers that I give out. It's kind of one of my signatures. That font's a little big. Not going to lie. There we go. I think that's better. There we go. All right. This is, it's actually session 11, but we're going to talk about project solutions and unit testing. Oh, this is something that folks that are, that are coming into .NET from, from outside of, um, outside of .NET, outside of, it, JavaScript even has a little bit of a project file, but, um, folks in Python, folks in Ruby don't have this concept of what a project is. Right or or a solution. These are structures that are kind of unique to .NET. And I want to make sure that we know where to to how, where they fit in with things. Hey, where do you get this T-shirt? The using Microsoft Maui. I look a little bit fuzzy for some reason. Hmm. Um. You know what? I uh I forget where they were where they were selling these. And they were raising money to give to a tech charity. Um. I forget if they're still available, but we'll we'll talk a little bit about .NET Maui today as one of the different project types that you can create. Uh, no, no, not shaming Ruby at all. I don't I I don't think Ruby has a concept of a project. That might be good. That might be bad, depending on how you look at it. But it, that's okay. That that's how they build their applications with with the Ruby programming language. It's just, here's the content of the folder versus .NET. We have this very prescriptive. These are all the things we need to compile together to build our application. So whether you're using .NET at the command line or in Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio 2019, the new Visual Studio 2022, Visual Studio for Mac, or Whatever other text editor you might be using, code editor, there's other ones out there from folks like JetBrains called Writer that you can check out as well. But no matter where you're working with .NET and you go to, you want to build an application, you're going to end up building a project. And a project is, is a unit of .NET code of, uh, that you can reference, you can share, you can compile, you can ship. And we're going to see more about the different types of projects that you can build. The easiest way for folks to get involved and start using .NET is with the .NET SDK. This is a command line tool that you can use on all the operating systems. Whether it's Windows, Mac, or Linux, you'll be able to use this to start, start building a project. Not just use a template to start that project, but... Um, but also you'll be able to compile that project, be able to run tests for that project, and a bunch of other things as well. Let's take a look a little bit more at the .NET SDK. Now, the easiest way to get it, you can read through all the text that I wrote here, but the easiest way to get it is right here. Click on get.net, and it's going to take you to another website over here where it's going to say, hey, you want to download .NET? <clears throat> Here's all the ways that you can get it. And we've got options available for all your favorite operating systems, including Docker containers over here. So there are two versions of .NET that right now you can download and run on all of these. And these use the what was called .NET Core, but now we call just plain .NET. Okay, This is a new version of .NET since the old times of when .NET was originally made available. Way back in 2002, on Windows only, what we now call just .NET Framework. Going forward, though, our recommendation is that you build with .NET 5 and the upcoming, you can see it way up top here, .NET 6. I mentioned it's going to be released next week as part of .NET Conf. So we have a release candidate available for you if you're watching this video now. If you're watching this video sometime in the future, sometime after after the beginning of November 2021, uh, this is already available for you, and these versions here are probably no longer here. 
we have different support capabilities with the various versions of .NET that you can get. .NET Core 3.1 was released uh, two years ago and is a long-term support release, LTS. You might see LTS support versions with Node.js and other frameworks, other tools that indicate this is the one that we're going to support for a longer time. There's also a current release train, and the current release says we're going to support this for about a year, a little bit longer, until the next version comes. This way you can get those latest features and be aggressive about how you, how you adopt those features if you'd like, and when you find a version set there that you that you enjoy that meets your needs, you can switch trains and go from the current version to the long-term support version, <clears throat> and kind of lock in which version of the tools you're working with and have support for a long time. And there's information behind these you can click into to get to be able to see more about, well, here's how long and what those support terms mean. Um, do, uh, do I think that's kind of a strange way of naming going .NET Framework, .NET Core to .NET Asks Gyeong? Um, the challenge, I, I, I want to make sure I answer this correctly and succinctly. The challenge is, um, you the challenge is these are all very related tools frameworks and ecosystems one evolved from the other and the third one dot net is is the the collaboration the merging of the two the challenge is how do we name those in a way that isn't just version one version two version three but also indicates this is a breaking change to go from to go from .NET Framework 3.5 to .NET Framework 4, even though that's a major version number change and indicates breakage in the APIs, right? When you see version number changes and that first digit changes bef to the left of the decimal, that indicates it's a breaking change. Um, this was more than a breaking change. This is a complete rewrite. So it necessitated a new name. And at the time, we couldn't just call it .NET. There were other names that were kicked around as well. But we, we couldn't call it just .NET. And it was because it didn't include all of the desktop tools and frameworks to build applications. Certainly not the mobile applications. So it was really just the web and console applications that were supported in the first versions of .NET Core. So they called it .NET Core. They, they said, well, this is just the core. This is just a, an inner bit of this and it slowly grew and as the other parts merged into it well it wasn't just the core bits of it and it became just dot net in 2022 dot net core 3.1 will no longer be supported and there will not be a dot net core that is available that folks will be confused with and trying to figure out well how does this fit in we'll just have dot net all right let me scroll back up here. Um, could we count package JSON? Anton says, "Can we? Could we count package JSON from Node.js developer as really some sort of equivalent um, to a project file?" I, I think you're right, Anton. Yeah, a project JSON. I'm sorry, not not project package JSON. Project JSON was something else that's no longer used. Package JSON um, from Node.js very much defines. Here's references. Here's the metadata that define my project when I build a node package. Yes, I think you're absolutely right there. Um, let me see here. I'm going to scroll down. Let me see. Uh, Khan says, .NET Core with jQuery. What do you think? Sure, why not? Why not? Uh, you met a, Chris on YouTube says, I met a lot of people who think the core moniker means it was a junior version and not fully featured. That, yes, we heard that as well, and that's no longer a thing. Um, no, jQuery has a fantastic plugin system, and uh, there's a lot of 
a lot of tools and things that you can use there that work great for building applications. Um, navigating around and selecting elements, you can do with plain JavaScript now. A lot of those features are now built into JavaScript. But the jQuery plugin system will give you a lot of capabilities very easily. So I, I think it's a fantastic ecosystem to get involved with. <coughs> Excuse me. Hey, Cool Beans, just learned in C Sharp yesterday. How convenient. Fantastic. I've got a complete playlist here for you. Um, Wolfkin, cool glasses? Well, thank you. I look good as always. Well, gosh. Uh, I can't. Um, all right. So two different versions of .NET here that you can download and work with. The other version, .NET Framework, is a part of Windows, is the older version that's been around since 2002, and is not receiving um, new in investment for innovations, new features. It's out there, it's maintained, it gets security patches, but going forward, we recommend you use .NET 5, .NET 6, starting next week with the release at .NET Conf. Um, can I ask you about your glasses here, or should I wait not urgent? Um, these are gunner glasses. These block out the blue light, um, make it a little bit easier on my eyes. And with all the light, I've got four lights on here in the room and one, two, three, four, five, six, six screens on me. It's a lot of light pollution. So it helps me focus a little bit and doesn't tire out my eyes as well. How can we detect data race in .NET? Um, that's off topic, but I also don't know what you're referring to drop me a line on twitter or on my discord and we can discuss that further all right so this is where you can get the .NET sdk i already have a version of it installed here i'm here at the command line um i should be able to say .NET info and it's going to tell me what version and what versions oh dear lord I'm just polluting this machine, aren't I? Look at this. I got versions going all the way back to 2.1, 2.2, 3.1, 5.0, 6.0. Ugh. I got to clean this out. It, it's like it, it's like I just cleaned up this place five years ago. Look at it. All right. Well, I'll clean that up for next time. But the important thing is right here. This is .NET 6 release candidate 2 that I have available here that I can work with at the command line. Now, the templates look a little bit different in .NET 6. I'm not going to talk about all... I'm not going to dive in and get very .NET 6 focused this time. Not next week. .NET Conf next week. The week after, we're going to talk about C Sharp 10, a little bit of C Sharp 9, but we'll talk about C Sharp 9 and 10. And we'll talk about some of the .NET 6 updates that happened as part of uh, .NET Conf. So we'll have kind of a little bit of recap here on the show. Um, they do have a ton. These are the Lightning... If, if you're interested, the gunner glasses I have, these are the Lightning Bolt 360s. They actually... Uh, I have spare lenses that they ship that swap these out for sunglass lenses. So I have a bit of flexibility there. Um, you're welcome, Khan. Good to see you. Uh, binding elements, uh, displaying... I missed... To And w displaying data seems simpler? Yes, it is. Um, what's the best unit test module for .NET 6? Best is a little subjective. I like XUnit, and we'll show a little bit of XUnit today. NUnit is really good as well. Um, <clears throat> Exe says I should have stuck with Linux. Ah, we'd bounce around. Ah, we'll be in, in May. We'll be on a Mac. So because May is for Macs, I, I spend every May working with .NET on a Mac. Um, doo -doo -doo. yeah, we'll get to the unit testing. How long will I stream for? I stream for two hours. So, all right. Let's. So I have my, my tools available to me here. I have the .NET command line here. Um, right, .NET help will show me. Yeah, look at all the commands that are available to me here. 
on the .NET command line. There's a ton of these. And you don't need to know or appreciate or, or work with all of these. We're going to tinker around here um, and get into... Let me go into sessions. Uh, we are in season one. And uh, sure, we'll go into that one. What do we got? Yeah. Um, let's call this live. So all the samples are available. They're out on GitHub. You can click through to the website and, and see exactly what's there. But I'm going to run .NET new here, and this lets me build a new project. Now, in, in um, Node, right, <clears throat> you would do npm init, and it creates a new package file and asks you for all kinds of information to initialize that that package. Now, in and, and it writes out a package JSON. In .NET, we don't ask you for all those things. We just say, well, what type of project do you want to be able to create? And we will initialize a project file with that content and put some appropriate references in there, some things to get you started so that you can build whatever type of project you want. So unlike JavaScript, where when you're when you npm init, you're building an npm package. Eh, you could use it as a as a node website, but in .NET, we have to kind of pivot and include the various parts, the various right. If you think about if you think about programming as a series of Lego pieces, we need the appropriate starting kits so we can build that destination right that that project that we want to get to you're you're going to build the death star out of lego fantastic but you need the right lego pieces all allocated so you can work in that direction so we have a bunch of different projects that come by default inside the the sdk when you go to install so there's things here to build web applications a class library which is very much like a npm uh, library, right? An npm package. It's a it's a unit of of content, a binary unit of content that you can reference in other applications. And of course, I can build things for Windows here using WinForms and WPF. Now, I don't have my .NET MAUI content installed here. That's another workload that's available to us. Um, spell it right, Fritz. That we can install and make available for us to work with right here. Now, why isn't, why isn't the mobile stuff included by default? These are not small. The, these are significant sized um, parts of the SDK that need to be installed in order for you to be able to build and work with .NET MAUI projects. And .NET MAUI is our uh, multi-environment application user interface and .NET MAUI means you can build one application and it will compile and run on Windows Android iOS Mac OS there you go and there's the SDKs for all of them there's Windows mobile Mac catalyst iOS desktop Android that you can choose to work with there's also SDK workloads here for working on tvOS, if you like, WebAssembly, build tools, all these things that are a lot more to install that in order to keep the SDK size smaller aren't included by default. We make it easy for you to go out and say, eh, give me those pieces here so I can add them in and be able to build those types of applications um, with .NET. Um, any chance there'll be a visual database diagram tool? Um, Geo, I think that's something that you would more likely see in Visual Studio. Not so much part of the SDK to, to work with. And I don't, I don't know the state of the Entity Framework Designer in Visual Studio. I would need to look that up. Anton asks, can we add our own templates to .NET New? Yes, you can. Um, in fact, my... It, my friend Syed Hashimi uh, has a session next week as part of .NET Conf where he's going to talk about exactly that. 
how you define a template, where you install a template. Th those templates are made available as packages that you can download and install from, from NuGet.org, our public .NET package repository. And you can also download them from wherever you might share packages with, with your organization. It might be on a file share, it might be on a, a private web server, it might be uh, on a GitHub repository, or maybe even in an Azure DevOps repository. All kinds of places that you can install those from. But it makes perfect sense to be able to... It, it makes perfect sense to want a, the ability to specify standard templates for your organization, because you've probably got some standards for this is the way that we build applications. We have this theme that we want all of our web applications to have. So all kinds of um, reasons why you might want your own templates. How do you make those terminal colors? Um, there is This is Windows Terminal. You can go up in here and you can check into settings. And there are profiles that you can create over here and configure the color settings however you'd like. I didn't load my personal configuration into this one. But here under Appearance, you can tinker with this however you'd like. Uh, no. Um, but the my prompt here is in my dot .files repository. If you go out to github.com slash c -sharp fritz slash dot .files, you can get my configuration for my... This is oh my posh that is, is creating that prompt there. And you can grab that if you'd like and um, use it. Where can you get the t-shirt? I, yeah, I forget where I got it from. Um, Gerald uh, set up the um, the storefront for this, and I forget if they were donating all the proceeds to... to it, it was some un, uh, underserved tech community charity. I forget exactly which. iOS projects, yes. You can build .NET for iOS right there. Um, hello, hello, friends. So good to see you. Is the EF designer deprecated? I don't, I don't think so. Hanselman has a guide on the prompt. Yes, you can check out his, you can check out his blog. My configure, I have instructions on my, um, GitHub that'll get that configured for you real quick. That's right, Anton. .NET MAUI is the next evolution of Xamarin. Brings it tight with the rest of the the .NET ecosystem so that you can build and share content across all applications, regardless of where it's going. Um, who's this? Uh, Danny Al asks, how hard is C-sharp compared to JavaScript? I like to think C-sharp is easier than JavaScript because you have a compiler that helps you. Um, so, will .NET 6 include a GraphQL project template? There are GraphQL features that are arriving as part of Entity Framework 6. Um, my colleague Jeremy Lickness has a session at .NET Conf next week talking about exactly that. So check out the agenda over there at .netconf.net. Now that I'm over here, I can actually go to the website. .netconf.net. And... I believe... Where is he? There's EF Core 6. It's Wednesday. There it is. Modern Data APIs with EF Core and GraphQL. So check out that session for more on what we're doing with GraphQL and .NET next week. Okay. So I talked about what a project is. We've got this thing here we can go into. Let's build our first project here. Let's build a... Um, let me go back over and make sure I stay a little bit on script. So there's a whole bunch of other templates out here. Yeah, let me... Right, I did... Uh, if I say, oh my gosh, .NET new, and I believe it's a list, and it shows here's all the templates that are available. Not just those top-level, most common ones. Some of these are file templates as well, um, like a global JSON file, an editor config file a git ignore file appropriate for .NET. So an X unit test project, we'll get into that a little bit today. Um, I'll, I'm gonna come back to chat in just a second. Yeah, let's create a console app here. So .NET new, 
console, and I'm going to specify dash O, the output folder I'm going to write to. Um, and they said just to call it app one. Sure, let's do that. So app one. Okay. And notice it allocates it in the app one folder and it's got app one CS proj is the name of the project file it creates. And then it restores dependencies. Now, I've built my fair share of .NET apps on this device. So it actually caches them locally. There is a local cache on your machine of packages so you don't have to run out to, to the public repository and fetch them every time. They're locally, we don't have to go and re-download every time you say .NET new. Um, I'll go into this folder and you'll see there's just a few files here. And I can .NET run and I'll get a hello world output here. There it is, hello world. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself because the project templates for .NET 6 are a little bit different because we've simplified the programming language. We've simplified the .NET ecosystem a bit. Um, I think I can show you those now. and We'll talk more about them next time we get together. I want to take a look at chat here before I get a little bit too far um, too far into this. Uh, why is everyone hype about Python? Uh, I like C Sharp and consider that it is more elegant and easy to read. But why is all this data analysis in Python? Because it is interpreted and not compiled. Um, Python's free and open source. Free and open source and was made available in the early 2000s. Um, our friend Guido Van Russum, um, he's a colleague. Uh, I... I like to say that I like to think that Guido's a friend. I've had him on on a few shows. I've hosted a couple discussions with him. Very nice guy. Uh, the uh, founder of the Python um, programming language. Um, and they do very nice things with it. For educators, for college professors, for folks who needed access to do big, big data analysis, um, it was a tool that they could get into and start using, Python was, without having to work with Sun managing Java, Microsoft managing .NET. Um, it, JavaScript at the time wasn't there. It, JavaScript was only a few years old and didn't have big, big numeric capabilities, big data capabilities. So they leaned into Python as a way to work with and build algorithms, and it kind of stuck as something that they could build, maintain, that language for a very long time. Um, let me see here. Blink twice if Microsoft is holding me hostage, asks Fox McCloud. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, Diego Garber. Hey there, so good to see you. Diego asks, do I know if there are any plans for C-sharp in cheap microcontrollers? Um, you can check out... You can check out uh, Meadow. Uh, Meadow microcontrollers, and that's all I'm going to answer on this. I'm not going to um, dig into it, but wildernesslabs.co Enterprise-grade IoT Full .NET, real embedded, secure, and scalable. So you can dig in there, and that'll help you out with that. Um, continuing reading through, um, can C Sharp be used to link a device with command codings? I'm not quite sure what you're looking for there. Is it possible to be a full stack developer working only with HTML, CSS, and .NET? Asks Discordia. In about three to six months, yes. That's what .NET Maui allows you to do. Um, you'll be able to build a Blazor application that can run on the web or installed and run as a uh, native application running on your favorite operating system. Yes, yes. Um, continuing scrolling. Um, 
Alpha X3 Delta on Twitch says, I want to teach a buddy C Sharp. How do you teach someone the topic, the logic of programming, or do you say they understand it sometime? Um, I, I've been doing that for more than a year now on this channel. Um, all the, <clears throat> the videos are over on YouTube, youtube.com slash dot net. Check in the playlist for C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. Uh, you, you have to be patient when you teach folks. Um, hey, Thin Doll, I'm having a good morning. <clears throat> um, that is Oh My Posh, yes. Pandas, yep, that was a library that folks wrote to work with um, big data calculations. So, um, Python syntax for working with arrays and dynamic dictionaries are more direct, would make it easy to work with data for... I'm not going to go... I'm not going to say just that. I think there were some cultural things that happened there that that enabled um, enabled Python a little bit more than .NET. Um, do I know if Mali will have Linux support in the future? I, I it, it will not at release. <clears throat> after that, be we'll see after that what kind of demand there is and what kind of community support because maintaining that against Linux is not trivial. Um, Python's very quick to build a project, not speed, but iterations of a project. Yes, because there is no su such thing as a project. It's just the folder, and you tell it, interpret these files in this folder. When will Blazor take over the world? Sooner than later, I hope, but we'll see. Um, there's a lot of folks in the open source communities that are building tools and projects trying to get the tooling and capabilities of Blazor. And I think they're getting a little bit more attention than Blazor just because they're not Microsoft. Um, but Blazor, I think, is much more um, full-featured, much more mature. Um, is it hard to develop for Linux? No, it's not hard at all. What do I think about Avalonia? Fantastic project. It's something that I think um, <coughs> I think <clears throat> I think folks have done a, a fantastic job building it, evolving it. Um, there's I think it needs a little bit more promotion for folks to kind of latch on and say this is something that is um, enterprise ready. Are we rewriting C Sharp and Rust? No. <laughs> um, you need a SQL Management Studio for Mac OS. Mm, they, they will tell you that you can do that with the Data Management Studio built into Azure and the SQL tools that are in VS Code. That's what they will tell you. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I 100% agree with that. Um, I like a little bit more tightly bound tools. Um, you're 100% confident that .NET will dominate the Linux ecosystem if Maui gets supported? Um, interesting. It, something to further discuss when we get into planning .NET 7, but I can't make any guarantees on that. So, all right, we talked about .NET new. I built a new console application. Let me show you. I'll run Visual Studio Code here exactly what this template gave us and you're going to look at this and go that's not what we learned what the heck is this doesn't make sense <clears throat> so we end up with a project file and we end up with this thing over here program cs and program cs well it kind of looks like what we had in our in in our notebooks when we were building that we have just this console write line this is a console application so we're using the console and we're going to write a line out to it, and it's this block of text. Um, that's easy to understand, but there's no classes or structs or any of those things in here. It's it, th These are called top-level programs. We're able to write commands in one file that get directly executed in C Sharp. We'll talk more about that with respect to C Sharp 10 and the new features in .NET 6 next time. But in C sharp in C sharp 9.net 5, you can write these top level commands in a, a single file and they will be executed top to bottom. Now, 
Console, right line, hello world. That's not doing... Thanks so much. Go away. That, that's that's just fine. That it, It's just writing out some content there. Doesn't matter what it is. Right? <clears throat> right. Hello, Fritz and friends. Uh, I already have that open. Thanks so much. Run it again. And I get... Same thing. Okay? Big deal. But... What's important here is the project file that was created. So if we take a look here, app one CS proj, this is where we get all the instructions for the compiler, for, for the C-sharp compiler, for the .NET command line to be able to pull all those pieces together and allow us to have a binary file that we can execute, that we can work, work with. So we have this XML, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, we have this XML file that defines all the capabilities of our project. And why XML? This is the format that we've had since 2002. If there's one thing that you're going to see and learn and hopefully appreciate about .NET is that it is, for the most part, regarding tools, 100% backwards compatible. So all the things in here are built and available for you to use and it still works in older versions of Visual Studio. So this defines a project. The project is being built with the Microsoft.NET SDK. For different project types, this will have a different entry. It might be the Windows SDK. It might be the Web SDK. It might be the WebAssembly SDK. But you'll see those different versions pop up here when you say file when you say .NET new project you get the same experience when you're in Visual Studio and you say file new project and go through the wizard over there for the most part this content is hidden from us as developers but when you commit it to source control you store it out on GitHub or GitLab or wherever you may be stashing your code you're going to see this and it's nice to have an a primer on what this means so you don't get confused when you have to merge changes. So we have a property group here that defines these are the properties of this project that you need to know in order to build it. We're going to be outputting an exe, an executable file. We're targeting, in this case, .NET 6. There are other versions that you can drop in here. This is um, this isn't a runtime environment. Uh, identifier. This is a... Oh my gosh. I'm blanking on what these are. The the platform identifier. The framework identifier. I forget the name of it. It's a NuGet thing. Um, you'll also see Net5 in here. You'll see Net60-Windows. You'll see Net60-Linux that specify and kind of force the, the operating system you're targeting. Implicit usings. This is a C-sharp 10 feature. We'll discuss that next time. We don't need to talk about that today. And nullable. If the nullable features are turned on to, to track and limit the use of null in your C-sharp code. All built and defined here to activate and configure the compiler so that it behaves the way that you want it to. Uh, let me see here. I don't know if there's anyone reading through chat. Minimal and top-level statements are lovely. Yes, I completely agree. There, and we're going to get into a, a mode here over the next the next few years where we're going to really appreciate that change. It's a small change, but it, it makes a big difference in starting an application. I'm surprised I'm using Visual Studio Code instead of Visual Studio 2022. KC Collective... I use all kinds of tools here. I will be in Visual Studio 2022. It's right over here. But I bounce around. I was on Linux last week. I'll be on I'll be on a Mac in May. I'm I'm using my Surface Book. Uh, I was using a Linux-based laptop last time. So we we use all the different tools. We celebrate and recognize that .NET works great everywhere. Uh, do, 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 do. Let me see here. Is there a good situation to use F-sharp over C-sharp, or is it mainly preference? 
Um, I think it's mainly preference. Um, there are there are frameworks that don't support F sharp. You can't use F sharp with Razor templates, but uh, if, just as one example. So, um, okay, so that's a project file, and a very simple console here. If I wanted to build a library that I wanted to reference and include, and maybe it has some logic or something in there that I want to use with my application, I can create that library that'll have that business logic in it. So let's create a library here. Uh, .NET new class lib right there. You know what? Let's move that up. Can we move that up? I... You move up. Thank you. .NET new class lib and let's call this uh, my library. Okay, so it creates a class library, just a package of classes that we're going to bundle together and reference from other projects. You don't need to do this if you're going to reference from only one application, but if you want to share that library across multiple applications, you need to create, you would do better to move it into a library project like this. So now I'm going to go back over to Visual Studio Code. Um, I need to go up a folder. Let's go up a folder. And I will work here. And now I have, there's app one, there's my library. Thank you. Appreciate it, VS Code. You're doing all the things. So I've got two CS proj files, right? We saw app one CS proj and how it defined this is an executable file, but now I have my library CS proj. And just like before, it has project file and it has an SDK and it's building with the .NET SDK. It does not have that executable bit in here, right? We saw output type is an exe, uh, no, go away. Output type is an exe for app one, the console application. But for a class library, it doesn't have that here. Once again, target framework, and it has a, a framework identifier. That's what these are. And this framework identifier is net six. I knew I remembered that somewhere. Same here, dot net six. You typically want those to line up. There are There are scenarios where you want to build for a different target framework or multiple target frameworks so they can be referenced by multiple versions of .NET. For right now, that's a little bit more advanced than we want to get into. Just know that you can do that, and I'll uh, leave it to you if you want to research and look up a little bit more about that. Um, so in the class library, I still have implicit usings and nullable. They're also enabled by default. So. Let's go back over here. It generates for me class1.cs here, and I have class1. So let's put something into this. I'll come back to chat in just a minute. Um, so let's let's create something in here, and I'm gonna call this uh, calculator. And I'm gonna put just a very simple uh, a, a sum method, right? Um, public int sum, and I'm gonna take two integers, uh, and I'll call them addend one. Uh, Add in two, okay? And there they are. Um, why am I getting a under, oh, uh, comma. And yeah, not returning anything. So clearly a sum method is just going to return, right? Uh, add in one plus uh, add in two. Okay, there we go. So I've got my project built. I've got a way for me to, this method that's over here, I can build um, my library by executing, that's a little bit low on the screen. I can execute .NET build. And it will compile my application without running it. Now this is a class library. I'm in, I'm in my library folder here, so I just built my library and you can see over here all the way around to there my library dll dll is a dynamic link library this is a package this is a library of things that are a unit that i can reference but 
from other uh, projects. Now, that library, it, it's kind of operating system specific. We can build and deploy libraries using um, and, and package them using NuGet so they can be shared and made available and consumed by many different project types. Um, NuGet packaging, you can learn more about at NuGet.org. I'm not going to get into, into that today. Maybe we'll talk about it in a future stream. Let me take a look here. Um, you love how compact.NET 6 files are. I do as well. Uh, Riyadh. Yes. Totally agree. Uh, I, method man. I know. I know. It's okay. Uh, can I use the arrow function to make my method even more terse? Yes, I can. You're right. Um, don't necessarily need it, but I could absolutely do that. You're right. This is not an executable file. So if I try to .NET run this file, I'm not going to get anything. It's not an executable file. This library is just a library. It doesn't have an execution entry point. So how do we reference and start using that library? Well, we have to add a reference from our console application to the library. And we can do that over here. I'm in app1's folder now. I can do this now by saying .NET add reference and I can go to and say add reference to my library. That's easy. That I love being able to do that right there at the command line and I get that reference added to app to app 1. Well, what does that mean? And I'm doing this all on the command line and in the Visual Studio Code text editor so you can see these changes when they happen. Because I I think it's important to you that you learn some of the magic that happens behind those commands you so that you know exactly what the impact of these things are so that when you need to debug and figure out well, why isn't this working the right way do I have a right reference to something do I need to move some things around what's in that project file you have at least a basic knowledge of what's happening inside these files so here I added that reference well look here I've now got this new thing item group with a project reference it's referencing another project it's not referencing a DLL on disk because I'm in the same set of folders I'm referencing that project this means that when I compile and run app 1 it's also going to compile as a prerequisite my library it's got a pointer all the way to the project file now you don't always have the ability to reference and see the project files for references for things that are hanging out there that you want to include in your project that's where NuGet packages come in and you can point out to those packages that, that you might bring in from the public NuGet.org repository from a github repository or wherever else it might be stored and reference and include those so project reference include because it's inside my folders I can see and work with this here Okay, so that also means if I go over to my program, I can include and start working on that calculator class that I wrote. So if I say, um, let's do console, right line, and it's in my library. There, look at that, my library dot calculator. And you know what, I need, I need a calculator instance first. Let's create one of those. Uh, calculator, you know what, I'm going to shorten that. Calc equals new, my library calculator, so I've got a object there. Now I can say calc dots uh, sum, and I'm going to sum two and two. All right, I'm just going to write that out, right? Uh, let's even do a little string interpolation here. Uh, the sum of two and two is an... Okay, and that's a little bit hard to see. We'll do this and one of these. So I'm wrapping my code. You can see the sum of two and two is calculator sum, and we're just going to write that out to the screen. So I'll go back over here. I'm in app one, 
And if I say .NET run, it will first build the application and then run it. So, hello, Fritz and friends. The sum of two and two is four. Got it. Looks good. Ship it. We're happy with that. Uh, we're. <laughs> I see it's bananas there on on Twitch saying we're developers, we're programmers. We don't believe in magic. It's coming. It's coming. Where do you see this? Um. So, all right. Uh, all right. Yes. Oh, come on. See, spoiler alert, folks on Twitch know where I'm going here. They know where I'm going. We'll get there. We'll get there, friends. I promise. Now, these are very clearly related projects. And I want them to be able to see each other and manage them and be able to work with them inside of one bigger entity that's that's multiple projects so that I can see across all of them as one continuous workspace and that's what a .NET solution is so if I step up one folder here I can create a solution and there we go created successfully um, and there is live.sln. It's named after the folder that I'm in by default. I could have changed that if I wanted, but that's okay. It's this little solution file here. Let me show you what's in this before we get too far along here. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to warn you right now, I'm going to tell you this is not for human consumption. Unlike the project files, which are designed for something that you or I can take a look at and say, yeah, I know what that's going on there. This is not... This is a file that's been designed for Visual Studio to consume to help organize and move around and manage your projects. It's not something that we as humans can just poke into and make a small change and it's going to work just fine. Don't do that. Use the command line tool or, as we're going to see in a few minutes, use Visual Studio to manage this. So this has information about the Visual Studio versions that are supported and it has this... I'm not going to call it YAML, but this YAML-like syntax with tabs indicating sections and build configurations for the solution. The solution doesn't have any references to projects in it yet. So, let's add some projects into the solution. So, I'll say .NET SLN add, and I will add app1. Thank you. And SLN add, and I will add my library okay so now when I look at the solution file it's already evolved a little bit it's already got a bunch more junk in here my gosh it's almost as bad as the number of dotnet SDKs I have installed so right not only do we have these build configurations but look at this now we've got projects and project configurations in here there's the two projects right here look at this look at this GUID right this globally unique identifier I don't know what this is. And there's another one here. But they're pointing to, and they've got a name. Here's the name of the project. And here's where the project exists. So, and, and there's more GUIDs on the end of it. For our purposes, we don't want to have to manage that. And you see down here, information about the various build configurations. The solution lets you build and manage all of those projects as one unit. This way, when you have something that's more complex, you can build and, and have it deploy and reference all these little pieces individually. Consider if you were building if you were building a distributed application that had several um, that had several microservices in there you would want those to maybe reference some base data access layer that they all they all use so that you have a standard capability there. So you have a class library, and then you'll have the different microservices configured that all reference that one library. In this way, we can define a build configuration that says, you know what, don't just run one application run three microservices and in order to run those three at the same time when you start it, they need to build all their dependencies and the solution file will manage and enable that type of capability 
I'm going to move over to full Visual Studio now so you can see a little bit more about how this affects things. So here's live. Here's my live solution. I'm going to hide that for right now. But you see over here, there's app one. There's my library. And I can see all the content in my solution explorer. Now, this isn't very complex. There isn't a lot here yet. But... It is, it is, consequently, it looks like the file explorer in Visual Studio Code, or maybe you're using something like Nerd Tree Explorer in Vim. See that? I, there was a Vim shout out right there. Look at that. A Vim shout out on the Visual Studio channel. Reppin'. Look, this is going to get more complex, more capabilities for you as you build and work with projects. Check this out. I can even look in App 1, and I've got a dependencies branch here that shows you that there is a reference to my library from app one. And I can manage and add new project references with a cool little dialogue here that allow me to bounce back and forth and shows, well, here's the projects in the solution, or maybe you want to go somewhere else and grab another file and include that as a reference. You can do that from here as well. So this is the difference between an IDE and a text editor like Visual Studio Code. I've got some of these things built in here by default instead of having to layer them in and add extensions that add these capabilities. Hey there, CMJIO. Yes, this is very mono repo. All of the capabilities, all the things that I need for this solution are in one repository. I don't need to go and, and include things from six or seven different GitHub repositories. They're all in one place. Um, let me see here. I want to ask you, shed some light on how to think when writing unit tests. Yeah, we'll get in that. Absolutely. Certainly talk about that. When do we get the Emacs shout out? Sorry, life size teddy bear. We're we're a Vim family here in the Fritz house. Fritz Studios here. Um, Azure Service Bus is using those GUIDs. No, it is not. Nope. Nope, nope. Um, the build system uses it. Um what about GraphQL? Uh, GraphQL, there's features coming for it in .NET 6. More, you can see a session about that next week at .NET Conf. Won't be talking about that today. All right. So I have my project here. I've got my library. Let's write a unit test. Let's write a test to make sure that our add method works properly. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to create the test here in Visual Studio. I'll show you how I can run it in Visual Studio, and then I'll show you how I can run it at the command line, because you're going to want to be able to run it at the command line when you do things like continuous integration using Azure DevOps or, or TeamCity or Jenkins or GitHub Actions. You'll want that available. Um, so let's, let's add a project. So I'm going to right-click on my solution. Now I can say Add New Project. And I'm going to search for a template, and I want the X unit template. And come on, go find my X unit template. There it is. Thank you. X unit test project using C sharp. I could also write it in VB or F sharp that I'd like if I'd like. But you're watching a guy named C sharp Fritz. I'm writing it in C sharp. Um, I'm just going to call this. Uh, let's call this my tests. Doesn't matter. Yep. I can choose what framework I want. I want .NET 6. And now I get a unit test project. Now, a unit test project is a project that allows you to, to write tests, write code that tests other code. Check this out. So this is, if we look at the project file here, right? Uh, you go away. This is another .NET SDK. It's not an executable. It's a library. It gets loaded up into, it, into a, some sort of a runner and will execute at that point. So .NET 6, we're enabling nullable checking. We are not packing. We're not packaging this. It's, it's a test library that sits out there. We saw package. We saw project references. Here's package references. So we have these references to existing .NET packages that are out there on NuGet.org that will be downloaded and included. And this is common functionality that we can include for free to build out, in this case, our testing capabilities. So we're bringing in the .NET test SDK. 
This is going to let us run tests inside of Visual Studio, inside of the .NET command line. There's XUnit. That's the frame, testing framework I'm using. XUnit Runner Visual Studio is a series of um, adapters that allow XUnit tests to be run inside of Visual Studio. Coverlet will collect some statistics for us on um, how our tests are covering uh, the code that we've written. So those features are included for us by default. And I can start writing tests by building classes that have methods inside of them, like this one, test one. And all they need is this little attribute, this hint above it that says fact. So this is defining and saying that this is a test that we're going to execute and it's going to define some facts about the code that we're interacting with. There's other ways that you can interact with um, using, I believe it's theory is the other attribute I'm thinking of, that will allow you to specify and pass in other criteria to this. But let's start simple. Let's, let's just get started writing some tests here. And we're going to use facts. And this is just test one. And test one doesn't do anything yet. But I can reach over here to my tests, right click, and I can say run tests. And there's a little test runner that'll pop up. There it is inside Visual Studio, and it's going to execute that test, that one test that's in there. And what you'll see, there it is, it ran and completed in one millisecond. There it is, there's my tests is the name of the library, my tests is the namespace, unit test one is the name of that class. And test one is the name of that method. And it ran very quickly because there's nothing in there to do. I'm going to come back to chat room in just a minute. So I'm going to let's dock this at the bottom of the screen here so we can see our tests. And let's go in here and let's actually have this do something now. And to do something inside of our tests, to actually have it test something and check that does this pass? Is this valid? We use the keyword assert and we can say assert all look at all these different things that yeah I, thanks um and we can check all kinds of different comparisons so right i could say are these things equal i can say is this true and i can pass in true right and it's it's some boolean value right true takes a, a boolean condition so if i pass in true save that and rerun my test i'll just click the little test button here it'll run and of course it still comes back but if it is let's not make it false let's say assert one equals two right this is a a comparison not the assignment and we run that again of course now it's going to come up and say false 24 milliseconds and I can see over here an error message reported let me bring that over so one failed and if I click into the test it'll actually show me assert true failure true false now doing this type of comparison check like that isn't really how the X unit folks recommend you do this if you're checking whether something's equal use the equal method and you can pass in, well, what's the value that was expected? And what's the actual value being returned? So now if I say, well, I expect it to be one and the value returned is two. And really, right, um, output from something cool equals two. And I could say, well, check that one is the output from something cool. And I can run those tests one more time and of course it's false and it shows expected see now this reads a little bit cleaner I expected the value one but I actually got two now I can dig into that test and inspect a little bit further and look into it and appreciate what that test has surfaced as an error let me come back to chat here 
Um, Lords says F sharp uh, F sharp Fritz confirmed. Yes, in we're looking at about February, we'll have an F sharp series of streams here. Interesting how in C sharp tests are a separate project says uh, Agle, um, instead of being in the same project as the code they are testing. Sure, because I don't want my test to ship inside my production code. That's a an area that's a surface area attack that I don't want to expose. It's something that that I want to avoid sharing that code that is really meant for test only. It's a developer and test environment thing only that doesn't need to ship with my production application or ship with with my code and running in production. Um I'm sorry, what's this? No. Uh, what about behavior-driven development in spec flow? Asks uh, Bulat. Um, so this is... We're, we're just writing unit tests at this point. There's a couple of practices that drive into unit tests and, and help to create a more test-aware and test-friendly environment for when you are building your application. It helps to make your application more maintainable, more flexible, and some of the solid principles that we learned, la was it last time or the time before? Um, it help with that. And test-driven development, or TDD, is a way for you to write code that specifies we're gonna write our tests first. Some folks get a little wrapped up in that and um, so much so that they won't write any code unless they have a test first. I'm a believer that there's a place for that and you can go a little bit overboard and not, not be as productive in getting shipping code written if you are too test driven. Another form of that is called behavior-driven development, or BDD, as Bulat hinted at there on YouTube. BDD is a way for you to specify how an application is going to work in a syntax um, that is of the format given, when, then. And SpecFlow is a tool that installs in Visual Studio. There's another tool called Cucumber that's available out there that you can um, use as well that drive this type of syntax interaction. Now, here I'm quite clearly defining and saying, here's the value, run this test. Uh, there's, um, and let me get into testing the calculator method that we wrote, and we'll, uh, I'll talk a little more about given, when, then, and arrange, assert, and act are the practices that folks use when they're writing tests. So they can include and um, write them very strategically and uh, in, a, in a conforming, comprehensive way that's easy for folks to be able to follow in the future. Um, what do I think about Maui? Asks Mondelez over on Twitch. Uh, I think it's going to be fantastic. It's still in preview. Looking forward to seeing more in the next few months. Is randomless a thing in unit testing? Yeah, why not? Yeah. Um, I would create a random uh, random seed and include and reference that inside my tests if I needed to. Wasn't quite straightforward. Seems to... It's not meant to be done. No, I, I would manage it myself. Excuse me. Oh my goodness. Hey, Justin H. Horner. Good to see you. So, let's write... Let's first off fix this. So, now that should run and test properly. Down here at the command line, at in my unit test explorer, that should turn green. There we go, and I get one one test, it, and it passed. Okay. Um, if I wanted to run that test at the command line, maybe you want to run it as part of a a build process. Um, I can go into the my tests folder and I can run at the command line 
.NET test, and it will restore and execute those tests appropriately. There we go. Zero failed, one passed. And you can also, for those of you that are, uh, are not red, green, colorblind, you can see that it's green, right? The numbers are all spelled out here, but as an extra clue to those of us that can see red and green, you can see that the text is in green. You don't even have to read it. You know that all the tests passed. If any of the tests had failed, this would have turned red, right? Um, so I'll run .NET test again. There it is building. See, everything's in red along with the error. So you have all the information for the, those folks that are colorblind and can't see, but for those of us that can see red, green, right away you know you get that extra hint that there was a failure all right so let's let's go and reference and check out that calculator we started writing um we can take a look at uh enjoying this on your pixel phone says dj curry synth awesome glad you're enjoying that which do I prefer and why? Asks Rolly Rolls. X unit or N unit? Ooh. So N unit is another unit test framework. Let's actually go out to those websites. Um, so, uh, is it xunit.net? Yeah, there it is. X unit. Um, xunit.net is uh, written by a handful of folks. Uh, James Newkirk, Brad Wilson, Claire Novotny, um, and has been very actively maintained, had features added for 10 plus years now. Uh, really nice library. NUnit, though, was a, a derived from JUnit, very much the same syntax, and was one of the first unit test frameworks on .NET. Um... And there was a time where, oh, you can't see it down there below. No, you can see it down there at the bottom. Uh, Charlie Poole and Rob Prouse make this. Um, I There was a time with .NET Framework that I was all in on NUnit. Really enjoy, enjoyed using NUnit. And I was a big fan of this framework. Um, as .NET Core started coming out, the, the folks that maintain NUnit stepped away for a little bit. And that's okay. The XUnit folks were working in lockstep with the .NET team to build and tune and enable XUnit to work with that framework. They also wanted it to work with Xamarin and other places .NET ran. So in order to get good unit testing support with .NET Core from the very early days, you had to use XUnit. So I've since um, become a bigger fan of XUnit than NUnit. I can bounce back and forth between them. The syntax is very similar. But for for my money right now, I'll write X unit files and tests. Um, can't wait for new features in C sharp coming up at, in the future. Yep, I'm I'm not going to get into describing or discussing those right now. Um, been playing with the .NET CLI to test on every file save, says Chris Gomez. Any advice on that? You can do .NET watch test. So this is something... Um, so I'm in my test folder. There is a .NET watch command that you can execute. And just like um, the watch commands that are available on other frameworks, other command line tools, you can say .NET watch and then specify a verb for it to execute. So I can say .NET watch run, .NET watch test, and it will either build and rerun the application every time there's a change or build and run all the tests every time there's a change. So I can do something like, oh, come on, where is it? Where is it? I don't have my hotkeys loaded here. Not color schemes, actions. And I want to split the pane. Close pane is Control Shift W. What is a split vertically? Alt Shift minus and plus. There we go. 
So what I'll do is over here, let's go dev C sharp and C sharp Fritz sessions season one. Uh, there, now I'm in the same folder. What I like to do is uh, let's go into my tests and I, it's all small here behind me. I don't care, right? Let me move that over so you can see this. I, I don't care the, the text that's in here. I'm gonna run dot. I'm gonna run .NET watch test and just let this run over here in this panel. And like I said, I don't really care what's in it because I can see red green. I'm just gonna leave these really small and tuck it over here so that as I work in this panel over here, I just have to glance over and I can see, well, is there an error report? Is it still green? And I'm good to keep working. So over here, right, if I go into, um, do I have Vim here? No. Uh, do I have Emacs here? Of course not. Um, right, I can run uh, Notepad on unit test one. So I would, I really like doing this uh, this type of work on uh, on my Linux machine, right? So uh, I might have whatever text editor over here and I've got my tests running just fine over here and I can add another test by defining a fact, right? Look at this, I'm writing code in Notepad. Uh, test two, right? Um, and I don't know, assert dot, uh, true, uh, true, uh, doesn't matter. I'm just trying to show that, right? So I've added that test, save, and behind me here, see that? I hit save and it immediately started testing. It's green, fine, move on. I know that code works, right? Similarly, if I change that to false, save, and it's immediately building and I can see, oh, Okay, I've got an error here, and I can even zoom in at that point and see, well, where was the error? And I can go through and fix that appropriately, and it's going to rebuild again. And there we go. It's green. Good. Move on. Next. So I feel, I feel good about that. Having that real quick, rate code, test executes, interact. You do also have this in a much more powerful way available to you inside of Visual Studio. So if you have the enterprise version of Visual Studio, um, and I'm not gonna try and sound, sound like a salesperson, but if you have that, there is inside of here live unit testing. And what live unit testing will do is as you're writing code, it will execute, there's the output, thank you. You get, get in line here with the rest of no, I, I, I wanted you to dock there with that. Thank you. It's building, it's running the tests, and it's going to give me little indicators in the code where code has been executed. And you see the, the little check boxes, the little check marks now inside my code and indicating this code was executed. I also get some information here about the test, I can run it, I can debug my test, all right here inside of Visual Studio. Let me come back to chat here. Speaking of green and red, GitHub is changing the color of closed issues from red to purple. Was a pretty popular topic this week. I don't understand why they're doing that. I need to read more about that. Um, I, I spent the entire weekend away from my uh, away from reading tech and, and my computer. I, I don't know what happened. Um, so, um, any complicated test templates to show? We'll write a, a comp more complex test here in just a second. Um, do, 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 do. It, it's not quite CICD. So, it'd be interesting to be able to pick and choose which colors represent what in the CLI. Um, you can do that. You can do that. I don't know exactly how you configure it, but there is a way to do that. So how to write tests for large size, complex real world applications. Well, let's, let's get into the a little bit more complex example. Let's go to that calculator example that I wrote earlier. So I need a reference. So I'm going to, where to go? Add uh, project reference. 
there we go. I'm going to add a reference to my library. And going to the BDD concept and, and writing things that are a little bit more structured. Um, somebody was asking about MS test. Not going to cover MS test. Um, and the, the preference in the open source community is typically X unit or N unit. Please explain why. Please explain what why. Why test two lasts longer than test one? Ah, sure. I'll show that quickly. You get this little bit of performance information here, and it shows that test one took two milliseconds, test two took 65 milliseconds. When .NET code runs, there is just-in-time compilation that happens. So when you compile your code with .NET build at the command line, or maybe you come up here in Visual Studio and you say, build solution. It builds and delivers an intermediate language, an inter in some intermediate code. When that is actually loaded and executed, there is a very quick just-in-time compilation that happens when you deploy to Windows, Mac, Linux. Assuming you don't, and it, for Blazor you can do ahead-of-time compilation. But there's that little bit of just-in-time compilation that happens where .NET actually goes through and executes and gives you that assembly code, that binary code that actually runs on the processor. That is what you see right here is it's doing that last little bit of just-in-time compilation to run this block. Then when it comes through and executes this, it's already compiled the class and, and is ready to go with that content. So let me unpin this, and if I were to write one more test into here, right? So let's add one more, and this one I'll call test three, and let's say assert equal Jeff and Jeff, all right? And live unit testing has already actually woken up and completed running that test. And two milliseconds, five milliseconds, one millisecond. It's it's got this slight difference because this is the one that it ran first. Then these other two take a little bit of time and they eventually get executed. But there's that little bit of just-in-time compilation that happens. All right. When I like to name and build my tests, I like to put things into folders and classes such that I get that given when then naming. So over here, I'm going to create a folder given um, given my calculator, right? So you might have other scenarios that you're going to define with a given, given some scenario. So here's the scenario that I'm going to start testing. Let me close up my app. Now, right, I'm going to create a class in here and I'm going to call this when adding two numbers. So I'm making it very clear, this is what I'm doing. I, I might make this class, I might call it when summing two numbers, right? Or something that directly references, this is the thing that I'm testing. So I'm gonna make this a public class. And down here, um, let's create our first test for this. So public void, uh, given when then, should add properly okay and i'm going to put decorate this as a fact and i'll control dot on this and get my using statement for x unit now i could turn that into a global using statement more on that another time but this syntax that you see here look at this you can see it in my namespace given my calculator when adding two numbers then well uh, they should add properly. It's very clearly defining a requirement. Given this object, given this scenario, when I do this thing, then this should result. So now let's do it, right? Var my calculator. Uh, okay, so calc equals new my library calculator. And really, I should put that somewhere where it's going to be shared and I'm not creating it every time. Refactoring and how you structure these is something that 
we can talk about more later. Um, let's, uh, let's define my two add-ins. So let's call this uh, add one, and I'm gonna call this two. Var add two equals, sure, I'll make it three. Now I can say assert equal, um, and I should do this actually as an action. Let, let's do this as an action. Uh, let's call this result equals uh, calc dot sum. There we go. Add one, add two, right? And I got a little bit of IntelliCode helping me generate those. Uh, IntelliSense, I'm sorry. So expected, well, two and three should be five, and the actual is result. Now, this structure is the three A's when we build these. Arrange, act, and assert, okay? I've arranged my code. This is all the prep work that I need in order to run this test. I've acted. Here's that when thing that I'm gonna do. When, sum this up. Assert, check to make sure that this works properly. We've got about eight minutes left. So very simple structure here, and I've got some red X's there. More on that in a minute. Let me take a look over here at chat. Geek Girl, hey Geek Girl, good to see you. Geek Girl on YouTube says, weekends for video games or yard work. Uh, we, were, we were out riding horses this weekend. <laughs> no spec flow this time. What should we test? Robert Martin says, every line of code, no. Uh, Karash, that is, I completely disagree. You should not test every line of code. You should test where your business value is. Testing every property, every initializer, all those things, no. Way overboard. Do not do that. Test where your business value is. That w will help you significantly. Um, please explain. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I don't have enough time, and you're a little bit off topic here. Sorry, Kwaku. Um, seems to have confusing the red color with the closed status is the same as seeing errors. Oh, oh, for the GitHub thing. Okay. You don't use code coverage percentage as a metric for unit testing. Uh, okay. You see it as to represent requirements, says Chris. Interesting. Um, interesting naming scheme. So, um, Steve Smith, you'll find him on Twitter. You'll find his website, rdallis, A-R-D-A-L-I-S, um, specifies and uses this, uh, this naming scheme. Um, you can find his blog, more information about him over here. Really great stuff and directions that you can go, extensions of using this type of naming scheme to specify your tests. Does the test method must return void? Yes, it should. Uh, is this on YouTube also? Yes, we are on YouTube also. Um, let me see here. Does Azure provide unit test service? No. You, you want your unit test to run as part of continuous integration when you build and deploy. So Azure DevOps has a uh, feature where it'll run your unit test every time you uh, check in code. Greetings to you in Belgium. Um, let me see here. Okay. How much, what percent of project time should I spend on unit testing? There are some folks that say you should spend 50% of time. Um, depends on the project. Um, so how to run tests asynchronously. Not going to get into it. That's it. I've got eight minutes, five minutes left. Not going to get into it. I've clearly got a bug here. And if I mouse over the X, it shows it's covered by one test. And if I go into my unit test bit here, right, it's going to show, right. And look at how this reads. Given my calculator when adding two numbers, then should add properly. Expected five, but only got four. So now I know here's where the error is and I can dig through and solve that. So if I hit F12 on my sum method, here it is and I can see, gosh, I didn't add those properly. I'll change that to a two and watch. Live unit testing kicks in and did you see it? It went from the red X's to the green checks immediately. Also, over here, where .NET test was running, there it is. It, we got a green coming back that it ran 
properly. So all my tests ran clean. I know more about the health of my code in that business logic inside my calculator here, and it's very simple business logic for this, we know works properly. Last thing that I want to talk to you about is something called, mm, do I want to get into mocks? I've only got four minutes. Um, I'm not going to get into mocks. Um, we learned last time about solid construction, solid design principles. When you are passing in these requirements, these dependencies that one class depends on that comes from somewhere else, because you're passing in interfaces, it's possible when you're testing to pass in something that adheres to the interface, but behaves in a way that we define it to run. And that's called a mock. We'll talk about that another time. Let me head back over to the other machine. We have three minutes left. Let me answer questions and get us wrapped up. Get you set for the next stream over here on the big .NET network. There we go. Um, that would have been a good calculator. I don't know about that. Um, you want to learn about mocks one day? Yeah, we can get into the mocks, fakes. There's a whole set of things going on over there. Um, how important is it to have a good software architect designed to write a good test? The, the test will help drive out better architecture. They'll help, for, to, they'll help force you to create better architecture. Geo asks, do I recommend text.json over Newtonsoft? Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, there's a significant performance increase you'll see in text.json because of how it uses memory. And starting with .NET 6, it actually generates code at build time for serializing and deserializing. Yes, unit testing is more for developers than quality assurance. Quality assurance uses different tools, integration testing tools. Unit testing is something you're going to want to do directly on your code so you have assurance that it works the way you want it to before you send it on. Um, I also am, am a firm believer that you should write unit tests when you have bug reports. So your unit test shows that the bug is fixed and will never happen again. Hello to you in Poland. Uh, do I write for my programs? Do I write tests for my programs? Yes and no. For some programs, absolutely I do. Um, big program that I've been building over on my Twitch channel, Clip Talk. I haven't. I need to. I really need to. There's a lot going on over there. It's gotten very complex. I need to spend like a week or two just writing tests. As to the future, uh, the issue of code coverage, it is tackled pretty simply. Just use BDD and the relevant tools like Specflow properly. You keep talking about Specflow, and I'm sorry, I'm not getting into that. And I'm that I completely disagree with saying use BDD and, and tools like Specflow. If the areas in your algorithms in your application have close to 100% test, 90% plus, you're in great shape. I, I wouldn't go through and make sure every property and every initializer is tests tested. Am I using Win 11 yet? Yes, and it actually broke my Docker install, and I have to go back and fix it. Um, there, no pun on my shirt. Using Microsoft Maui, it's a using statement at the top of .NET Maui applications. Um, is there an end-to-end -end framework for .NET Core for testing? Uh, look at Playwright, which actually is very much like Selenium. We are out of time, friends. Um, my videos are not over eight hours long. No. Garage. Uh-uh. No. My, my videos are usually two to four hours. So, um, I have workshops out there that are more than eight hours long. And, yeah. So, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Let's uh, let's wrap it up. Let's call this a day here. Get you over to another video, over to some more streaming. We've hit the end of our content together today. Oh, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm trying to hit that. There we go. Thank you so much, those of you that are watching on Learn TV. If you're watching over on YouTube, hope you have a great rest of your day. We've got more content coming both on YouTube and Twitch. Check out the playlist on YouTube. Uh, Learn C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. You can find me streaming on Twitch. 
twitch.tv slash C Sharp Fritz. I'm there Tuesdays, Thursdays, and typically Sundays. Writing code, building things with Blazor and Azure. I hope to see you there. Take care, everybody out there on YouTube. And for everybody else that's watching on Twitch, let's set up for a raid. Let's see who else is streaming on the big Twitch TV network. We're going to get you connected with somebody else who's streaming, talking about tech, and hopefully share some cool content. Um, taking a quick look over here. Um, I think we're going to get you connected with... You know what? Let's go over and let's check out our friend Lana Lux. She's doing a little bit of game development, a little game planning as she builds with Unity. Unity is a framework that you can use to build .NET games. Build games with .NET. There, I said it, right? Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. I hope you have a great rest of your day, wherever you might be. I'll see you tomorrow at about the same time. I've got four hours. We'll be streaming talking about Blazor, WebAssembly, web development, um, and Azure. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Take care. Get ready to say hi to Lana Lux for me, all right? See ya. <laughs>